Bible study this evening. We are in Genesis, uh, picking up about halfway through, a little bit more than halfway through chapter 44, excuse me, we're at verse 44, chapter 41 in the book of Genesis tonight. Uh, so last week, we saw how that Joseph was brought out of prison to interpret Pharaoh's dream, and the interpretation was that there would be uh, seven years of abundance in Egypt, just a, a bountiful harvest in the land, and they would be followed by seven years of famine. Verse 16 says, Joseph answered Pharaoh, saying, It is not in me. God shall give Pharaoh an answer of peace. So God gave Joseph the interpretation of Pharaoh's dreams, and then along with the interpretation, also the knowledge of what to do with that information, okay, that somebody should be appointed over the land of Egypt to prepare during the years of plenty to make sure that there would be enough to sustain the nation during the years of famine. So God had elevated Joseph from a pit up to slavery. You say, that's up? Well, he's going through several stages. From a pit, through slavery, from being forgotten in jail, up to being the ruler of the nation only under Pharaoh, who was the mightiest ruler of the mightiest nation in the world at the time. And we ended last week by saying, but God wasn't done with Joseph yet. So we're going to pick up this evening in Genesis chapter 41 at verse 44. Reverend Brooks, sir, would you please... Uh, pray over the Bible study tonight. Our Lord and Father, we ask you to bless this Bible study this night, God. We appreciate this opportunity to get together, Father. We appreciate your love and your word, God. And what's already been shared throughout this series of Bible study as we've been looking through Genesis, God. We ask you to open our heart, God, prepare that special place, God, and bless Pastor Watson as he teaches what you laid upon his heart this night in Jesus' name. Amen. So verse 44 says, And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without thee shall no man lift up his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. God wasn't done blessing Joseph yet. Pharaoh had given Joseph uh, the finest things of Egypt. He said, You are going to be my right-hand man. I'm going to do what you tell me to do to get this nation ready. So that we can be prosperous even when things are falling apart. Even when this time of famine comes, we know that the abundance is about to start. So we're going to follow your advice in order to prepare for that time. And Pharaoh gave Joseph absolutely the finest things in Egypt. Luxurious clothing, gold and jewels, a chariot. We see that Joseph married an Egyptian wife. Joseph had everything that Egypt could offer. Verse 46 says, Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went through all the land of Egypt. And in the seven plenteous years, the earth brought forth by handfuls. You think about how uh, harvesting is done. You're picking one piece at a time. They were picking things handfuls at a time. It was so abundant. So abundant. And he gathered up all the food of the seven years, which were in the land of Egypt, and laid up the food in the cities, and the food of the field, which was round about every city, and he laid up the same. And Joseph gathered corn as, but, uh, as the sand of the sea, very much, until he left off numbering, for it was without number. Joseph prospered more in Egypt, talking about Joseph himself, just, just leaving the prosperity of Egypt during this time out of it. Joseph himself prospered more in Egypt than would have ever been possible for him anywhere else in the world during this same time. Anywhere else in the world. Egypt was the most powerful nation in the world for centuries. They were at their very peak of prosperity and power at this time. They would decline over the next few hundred years, okay? But they were at the pinnacle of their power. And Joseph was more prosperous here than he could be anywhere else in the world during this time. It could be said that Joseph was the most powerful man in the world at that time. Now, Pharaoh was Pharaoh. But what did Pharaoh say 
in verse 16. He said, I am Pharaoh. Uh, excuse me, in verse, let me find it again. Verse 44. He said, I am Pharaoh. And without thee shall no man lift up his hand or his foot in all the land of Egypt. Pharaoh had the title. Pharaoh didn't step down from his throne. But Pharaoh did everything that Joseph said needed to be done. So it could be said that, Fa that Joseph was the most powerful world, man in the world at that time because he told the man who was the ruler of the most powerful nation in the world what to do, and that man did it. Pharaoh was greater only by the title that he held. Okay? That's not a stretch to say. It is not a stretch to say that. It's, it's just really something that when you're reading through the Bible and you're, you're saying, okay, what is God doing in this person? What is God doing for that person? What is God doing in that nation or at that time? Sometimes we think about stories that we've always heard. Oh, Joseph in his coat of many colors, and then he had a lot of prosperity in Egypt. These are actual world events that really happened in history. God was working with this man who was the most powerful man in the world. In the world. Pharaoh had the title, but Pharaoh did what Joseph told him to do. It's really something to consider. Coming down still through in the next few verses, it said, And unto Joseph were born two sons before the years of famine came, which uh, Esenath, the daughter of Potiphar, not Potiphar, a different person, uh, the priest of On bare unto him, his wife. And Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh. For he said, God hath made me forget all my toil in, my father's, in all my father's house. And the name of the second one he called Ephraim. For God has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. Even in his prosperity and even in this new land, even having gone through the hardships and now being at the peak of world power, he still maintained that same righteousness and faithfulness to God, which he maintained while he was in Potiphar's house and while he was in jail. He did not adopt the sinful customs of the Egyptians. He did not worship their false gods. He still knew who was blessing him, and it wasn't Pharaoh. He still knew that it was God who was blessing him. He still knew that it was God who brought him out of prison. Not the butler who suddenly remembered him after two years. It wasn't Pharaoh who elevated him when, uh, when God brought him out. Okay, The Bible says in the book of James, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights. When God blesses us, when we receive a blessing, when we're serving God and Blessings are provided to us. They may come through an intermediate source, a benefactor, if you will. Uh, I know a man who, well, this was in Washington, nobody that anybody, well, you probably know him, and I know you know him, um, but this was in Washington. I know a man who went to the Dollar Tree one time, and with a $100 bill, just started handing to them to the people that were in the checkout line, saying, here, this will pay for what you're buying. Mm -hmm. And he just started doing that for a couple of people in line. I don't know how much money he had, but it was just something that he wanted to do. He had a little bit, and he said, this is what I want to do with what I've got. And he blessed a few people. But the blessing that they received, if they knew where their blessing was truly coming from, it was through that man, but it was from God. Anything that we receive, it might be through another source, but if it's truly a blessing, it's from God. Now, what's the difference between just something good, something gain, a blessing, or a burden? If we're honest in how we gain it. If we're living for God as we receive it. There are some people who will rob a bank and say, oh, look, Look at me now. Or you can, you can look on the internet and see the lavish lifestyles of drug lords. And their kids are, you know, I, I, I didn't watch the videos. I don't watch all of this stuff. But sometimes when you're just scrolling through YouTube, 
things are shown to you. And I saw these kids, uh, you know, leaning against their hot sports cars with pet tigers and all these crazy things, just outlandish stuff. And who knows what else they were showing off, but they were the children of drug lords. That's not a blessing from God, okay? They might enjoy it, but it's going to become a burden to them. One way or another, it is going to be a burden to them. And if they do get saved and begin serving God, they're going to have to renounce that lifestyle. They're going to have to say, wait a second, got to leave this behind. Just like in men's Bible study, we're going through the book of Ruth, and we're going to see next week that she had to leave behind that whole lifestyle of being a Moabite in order to become one of God's people. Okay, But that's what it takes to realize that this is a blessing. Joseph had been faithful to God. He had not forsaken righteousness. He had maintained purity. And God was the one who elevated him. Yes, it was Pharaoh who put that gold on him. But the blessings were of God. It was Pharaoh who gave him a position and said, you're only under me. But it was God who brought him that far. When we're serving God, when we receive a blessing, it may come through the source of some intermediate benefactor, but the ultimate source is God. As long as we are truly honest in how we gain it. As long as we are truly honest in serving God in how we gain it. If we're not honest, you know, you can fill out a form. Say, oh, this, this program offers money to so-and-so who qualify for it. I could lie and get it. Well, then it's not a blessing. It's not a blessing if you're dishonest about it. And if you're not honest, then it's not a blessing. And it will ultimately become a burden one way or another. But, getting back to Joseph, even in naming his sons, we see this. We see that he maintained his righteousness and faithfulness to God. Because even in naming his sons, we see that he was leading his family in honoring God. He named the first son Manasseh, which means forget. And he said that uh, the burdens of everything he had endured at the hands of his brothers were forgotten. He said, God's caused me to forget the toil of my father's house. Okay, that didn't mean that he forgot all about dad and all about everything that he said he forgot about the burdens, everything that he endured at the hands of his brothers was forgotten by the way that God was causing him to rejoice now, causing him to rejoice. This was genuine, this was heartfelt. This rejoicing overwhelmed the sorrow of before. He named his second son Ephraim, which means fruitful. Joseph said this because his blessings were now so great that anything that he had lost before was superseded by what God had caused him to gain. Uh, Ephraim and Manasseh, even, even Sunday morning, uh, earlier this week, we preached and, and spoke about Ephraim and Manasseh as the children of Israel came into the promised land under Joseph and about how after they had conquered all of the cities that Joseph, had, uh, excuse me, Joshua had, had divided up among them and told them, okay, this is going to be your territory to, to the tribe of Issachar. This is going to be your territory to the tribe of Reuben and going down all through the tribes and those that would be divided up among them. Ephraim and Manasseh said, hey, we're, we're big enough that we count as two tribes. The land that you have divided for us, this hill that we're going to be settling on is not big enough. We want that mountain too, but it's covered in woods. There's giants in there, and they've got chariots of iron. Joshua told them, you want it? You can have it. Go and get it. God will give you victory over those enemies. If you want more from God, go and get it. We saw that even, even these descendants of Joseph, Ephraim and Manasseh, they claimed the abundance that God had promised to his people as their heritage. God had given Joseph so much abundance there in Egypt. And we see his children even later on, the descendants of them hundreds of years saying, wait a second, God's heritage for his people is abundance. Yes, yes. Abundance. When we forsake, when we say, I'm willing to forget everything that's behind me and press forward, even as Paul said, towards the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus, I have so much more abundance before me that I'm willing to, to say everything behind me doesn't matter anymore. I'm not going to be held back, burdened by what I lost. I'm going to press forward towards what I have to gain in God. And in the book of Joshua, we read about Ephraim and Manasseh. They said, this little hill isn't big enough. Joshua says, you want more than what we've set out on this chart and then this map? You can have more. 
Just yeah. go and take it. That's right. And that's what God says to all of his people. He said to Peter, when, when the disciples were there in the boat and they saw Jesus walking on the water, they were all afraid. All 12 of them were afraid and crying out in fear. And Jesus said, be not afraid, it is I. And praise God that the word of God gives us peace. Yes. And that was enough to calm all of them down. They said, the word of God has given me peace. I can rest now. The storm is raging. I saw someone walking on the sea and it was frightening to me, but the Lord has given me peace. I know that it's him coming to give me rest. Mm -hmm. And all 12 of them sat back in that boat in the storm and said, ah, well, it wasn't all 12 of them. It was 11 of them. The 12th one was Peter. And he said, really? You're out there walking on the water? Can I come out there with you? And Jesus said, come on. That's right. Jesus didn't command any of them, get up out of that boat and come walk out on this water. Peter just wanted to know if he could do more. And he did. None of the 11 sinned by staying in that boat. They were all rejoicing in the peace that God had given them. But Peter wanted more. Mm -hmm. Ephraim and Manasseh, they later on, generations later from Joseph, they said, we want more. And Joshua said, you want that mountain alongside that hill? Go and take it. God will give it to you. All right, all right. Abundance is the heritage of God's people. But we've got to do just as Joseph did. We've got to forget everything that was a burden to us before. We've got to realize that what we have to gain in God supersedes anything that we have to lose in coming to him. Mm -hmm. Joseph said, look, it took me 13 years to get here. 13 years of righteousness. 13 years of faithfulness. 13 years of purity. 13 years of dedication. 13 years of praying. 13 years of not giving up, 13 years of everything that went into serving God for 13 years, and now God brought him to that point where he said, this is worth it. This is worth it, praise God. The book of Psalms, chapter 84, says, for a day in thy courts is better than a thousand. He said, I had rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of the wicked. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. And, and that snippet that we take from that passage, no good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. That is a true, a precious promise that many of us know, that many of us claim, and it's wonderful. It's, it's true and precious. Again, no good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. But again, look back at what it says before that. And realize how truly Joseph embodies that statement about rather being a doorkeeper. I'd rather have the lowliest position before God and still be honest and faithful and righteous and pure before him. Than to give it all up and be elevated in wickedness. But because he was true and honest and faithful in the pit, as a slave, in jail, God elevated him and gave him Everything, everything, there was not a thing on the planet that Joseph could think of that he could not get. That's the absolute truth, the literal truth. If he wanted, what did they have at the time? They didn't have helicopters and stuff like that. Technology hadn't been developed. But if he wanted a pyramid built for himself, he could have commanded it done. And it had been done. If he wanted anything on the planet, if he wanted spices from China, they'd have sent ships to China for him. If he wanted anything, he could have had it. Why? Because God brought him to the, that, that position. But what did he still know? He still knew that more important than his simple desires was to hold the responsibility that God had given him. And so he still kept that responsibility of saying, okay, there's seven years of plenty. We've still got to prepare for the seven years of famine coming. We've still got to prepare. Chapter 41, verse 53. And the seven years of plenteous that was in the land of Egypt were ended. And the seven years of dearth began to come, according as Joseph had said. And the dearth was in all the lands. It wasn't just Egypt. 
It wasn't just Egypt that that hardship fell. But in the land of Egypt, there was bread. Why? Because Joseph had prepared for it. And when all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. And Pharaoh said unto them, that means when all of the people in Egypt ate everything that was in their cabinets, they said, now what are we going to do? They turned to the government. And the government said, hey, guess what? Because we've raised your taxes, they did it in a, wisdom, a wise term, a wise form, not just wasting it on all programs that our government wastes things on. But I'm not talking about politics. But nevertheless, they did prepare for it. When they turned to the government and said, hey, what can we do? Because now our cupboards are empty. Pharaoh said, good thing we listened to Joseph. He said to the Egyptians, go to Joseph, and what he saith to you, do. And the famine was over the face of all the earth. And Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold to the Egyptians. And the famine waxed sore in the land of Egypt. And all the countries came to Egypt to Joseph to buy corn because the famine was sore in all lands. So the years of plenty were very plenteous. They were so abundant. Uh, the harvest was, was so bountiful that they weren't able to even count everything that they brought in. But then just as Joseph had said, those plentiful years ended and the years of famine began. Okay, Coming into chapter 42, now when Jacob saw dad. Remember, dad's still up in Canaan. When Jacob saw that there was corn in Egypt, everybody hears the news. Wait a second, we're all hungry, but there's plenty of corn stored up in Egypt. Somebody down there did something right. Now, when Jacob saw that there was corn in Egypt, Jacob said unto his sons, why do you look upon one another? And he said, behold, I have heard that there is corn in Egypt Get you down thither and buy us some for our uh, and buy us some from thence that we may live and not die. And Joseph's ten brethren went down to buy corn in Egypt. So Israel, who is Jacob, complained about his sons sitting around doing nothing about their predicament. They had nothing to eat. I don't know what they were expecting. But they were not being productive at all. They were sitting around looking at one another. Uh, the Bible tells us that, that this isn't the way that we're supposed to live our lives. Paul wrote to Timothy. He said, if any provide not for his own, especially for they of his own house, he is denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Right. Okay. Some people make excuses for not doing what needs to be done. Proverbs 22, verse 13 says, The slothful man saith, There is a lion without. I shall be slain in the streets. Mm -hmm. Talking about how people will just make excuses for not getting out and doing what needs to be done. I heard there's a lion out there. It could be dangerous for me to go outside. There's going to be, just using current events, there's going to be ice on the road. I don't know if I can make it out. Well, there, there might be ice on the road. There might not be. You won't know until you get out there. Okay? But sometimes people just need the proper motivation. Okay? So Israel gave his sons the proper motivation. When he jacked them up, he told them, stop sitting around looking at each other. Get down there to where there is food because there isn't any growing here. If they made excuses about it being a dangerous journey, kind of along the lines of Proverbs, then he caused them to realize that he could either that they could either face those imagined risks or face certain death by starvation by staying where they were. And sometimes we just have to do that when we think about what's worse, what might happen or what will happen. I could go out there and try to make things happen despite what the risks might be, or I can sit here and do nothing and let everything fall apart while I do nothing about it. Sometimes we just have to make things happen. I've heard people compare worry, and I, I didn't prepare any quotes or anything like that, so forgive me for not having anything pithy uh, to state, but I've heard people compare worry to, to uh, lots of things. <laughs> like I said, I didn't prepare any quotes, but it's, 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 it's a burden. It's carrying a burden of things that, that may not happen when you could be fulfilling the things that you know 
can happen if you make them happen. And Joseph's, or Jacob's telling his sons, just get out there and make it happen. <clears throat> if you sit here and worry about it, nothing will happen. But if you face your fears, if you stop making excuses, if you face what may or may not be out there, you know you'll be able to get through it. But if you sit here and do nothing, you know you won't be able to do anything about it. Chapter 42, verse 4 says, Benjamin, Joseph's brother, Jacob sent not with his brethren, for he said, lest peradventure mischief befall him. Benjamin was the youngest of Jacob's 12 sons. Joseph was the second youngest. Um, but Benjamin was kept at home because Jacob evidently didn't trust those 10 older ones to protect him or even watch out for him at all. He said, I don't want Benjamin to go along with you because if something goes down, you're not going to do anything to take care of him. He'd seen what they'd done or not done to take care of or to watch out for Joseph. Now, he was still under the impression that Joseph was killed by an animal, all right? But he may have had a degree of distrust in how the others may have allowed it to happen, okay? Certainly, he saw their character in them sitting around doing nothing to make their lives better for themselves. So the brothers come down into Egypt, verse 5, and the sons of Israel came down to buy corn among those that came, for the famine was in the land of Canaan. And Joseph was the governor over the land, and, he was, and it was he that sold, uh, that sold to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brethren came down and bowed themselves down before him with their faces to the earth. Where have we heard that before? Joseph's brethren came and bowed themselves before him with their faces to the earth. And Joseph saw his brethren, and he knew them. But he made himself strange unto them, and spake roughly to them, when he said unto them, Whence come ye? And they said, From the land of Canaan to buy food. Joseph was still in charge, everything going on in Egypt. Now he was also in charge of negotiating international affairs, okay? These brothers did not realize that this Egyptian ruler that stood before them was Joseph, their brother. How would they ever have imagined that? How would they ever have imagined that? You know, sometimes that's the plot of, of a story or of a show, that the kid that was picked on in, in school, you know, 13 years later, they're the ones that are, you know, in charge of a big business or or they're the ones that are famous and successful. And the bullies are the ones that are all washed up in life. Okay? Well, here this is played out in reality, but to such a greater degree that it, it, it's simply unimaginable, except that it's true. Okay? The brothers didn't recognize him. This Egyptian man standing in front of us, negotiating all of these trade deals. He's being mean to us. Okay, they thought, they thought Joseph was dead. Coming down in a few verses, we'll see that as they're discussing things among themselves, that they thought Joseph was dead. Okay, verse 8 says, Joseph knew his brethren, but they knew him not. Joseph remembered the dreams which he had dreamed of them. Joseph remembered. He saw his brothers bowing down before him. They weren't worshiping him, okay, but that was how you would come and present yourself to a king or to a ruler. Joseph saw his brothers bowing down before him, and he remembered that God had given him a dream of this 13 years before, and he had told his brothers of the dream. And now God was bringing his plans to pass. Remember the dreams that Joseph said. Joseph dreamed a dream. He told it to his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. For he said unto them, Hear ye, I pray this dream that I have dreamed. For behold, we were biting sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf arose and stood upright. And behold, your sheaves stood round about and made obeisance to my sheep. And his brethren said unto him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us, or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And he dreamed yet another dream and told it to his brethren and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more. And behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. And he told it to his father and to his brethren. And his father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come and bow down ourselves to the earth to thee? And his brethren envied him 
But his father observed the saying. Remember, his father Jacob knew about God speaking through dreams and bringing them to pass. And now God was bringing his plans to pass through Joseph in those dreams that he had spoken to him 13 years, over 13 years before at this point. God brings his plans to pass. God does it in our lives just as surely and truly as he did in Joseph's life. But we cannot rush God's timing. And we may not know the circumstances that we'll have to face from when we are called of God, when we're given a purpose from God, until we see its fulfillment. Joseph lost his mother. He was abused by his brothers. He was sold into slavery. He was lied about and cast into jail on false charges. And then he was forgotten by those who promised to vindicate him. We, didn't, we don't know the circumstances that we'll have to face until God finally fulfills all that he plans for us, just as Joseph didn't know all that he would go through until God would fulfill that dream. We don't know how long it's going to take. It took the course of 13 years for Joseph, but during that 13 years, he remained righteous, pure, faithful to God the whole time and through every trial. Can any of us look back over the past 13 years and say, I've been righteous, pure, and faithful to God through every trial, through every temptation? Through every temptation, God had elevated him and given him more abundance than he could have known anywhere else. And now he still had more to do because God is setting the stage to bring reconciliation to that family. And there are a lot of people who can make success financially, there are a lot of people who can make success for themselves in business. There are a lot of people who can, who can build abundance for themselves in this life, fame and all prosperity stuff, at the cost of their families. But oh, how difficult is it for a person who's lost a good relationship to rebuild it? God can do that. God can bring reconciliation. And now after everything that God has done for Joseph, because of Joseph's righteousness and faithfulness and dedication and purity and remaining true, now God is also setting the stage to bring reconciliation to that family. Okay? And during these 13 years, we're going to see next week that God's also been dealing with Joseph's brothers. Okay? They're, they've still got attitudes. They've still got things that are working out. But God's been dealing with them through that time. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for all things that you have provided and for the good things that we have, and let us give you thanks for them. Help us, God, in our own lives to remain righteous, pure, and true, faithful to you, faithful to you through every temptation and trial, God. We don't know from today or from yesterday or from going back until we first heard your voice or knew your purpose for our life. We don't know from that point or from today what we may still go through yet, until your final purpose is brought to fruition in our lives. We don't know how long it will take, but God, we know that you will be with us. And we know that in remaining faithful, righteous, pure, and true to you, we'll see the fulfillment of what you've purposed for us. God, we look to you to make that happen. Be glorified in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless Amen. you this evening. God bless you.